vaccine mandate. The Biden administration reveals new rules for people who work at private companies. Infrastructure update. Lawmakers react to the latest developments on Capitol Hill. Abortion hearing. Democrats challenge the principles behind the new pro-life law in Texas. And Vatican visit. Pope Francis meets with a top Palestinian leader. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, November 4th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this Feast of St. Charles Borromeo. I'm Tracy Sable. President Joe Biden talked about vaccine mandates in September, and now it is official just two months from now. On January 4th, workers at midsize or big companies better be vaccinated or else. And it is the or else that makes opponents angry. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. Today, President Joe Biden released a statement saying basically he did not want to make the vaccinations a requirement, but the ongoing pandemic left him no, left him no choice. And the pushback has been fierce. For unvaccinated Americans, time is running out. That is if they work at a company with 100 employees or more. By January 4th, workers in the U.S. have to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 or get tested for the virus weekly. That applies to about 84 million workers. Unvaccinated employees also must wear masks. President Joe Biden writes, vaccination is the single best pathway out of this pandemic. And while I would have much preferred that requirements not become necessary, too many people remain unvaccinated for us to get out of this pandemic for good. South Carolina Congressman Jeff Duncan responds, Mark my words, we will fight Biden's authoritative COVID-19 vaccine mandate because it has no place in a free country. This is tyranny and cannot stand. For those who work at a health care facility, nursing home, hospital, with Medicaid or Medicare patients, they too fall under the vaccination mandate. They can ask for a religious or medical exemption, but there is no weekly testing option. Working from home or outside, the vaccination mandate does not apply. And starting December 5th, employers must offer employees paid time off if those workers decide to go roll up their sleeve and get a vaccine. And also, those same workers must be allowed paid sick leave if the vaccination causes side effects. The Los Angeles County Sheriff says vaccine mandates are already hurting his force. Dozens of people are leaving his department. People are not happy with the vaccine mandate. The fact that we're seeing the uptick, we are attributing it to the vaccine mandate. Now, a petition has been launched by Senate Republicans to vote down the mandate, just get rid of it. Companies could be fined a lot of money, thousands of dollars, and the government only has so many inspectors to enforce the new rule. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. And joining us now is Tom Bevin, co-founder and president of Real Clear Politics. Tom, welcome back. Always good to see you. I, I want to talk about the vaccine mandate, but first, some other big news happening today. A Russian-born lawyer living in the D.C. area was arrested and charged with making five counts of false statements to the FBI. This is all part of the Durham investigation. Uh, one more can you tell us about this, and how significant is it? Well, it's very significant. I mean, he was the main analyst collecting all of the information on the steel uh, for Christopher Steele for the dossier, which ended up being the foundation for uh, the Russia hoax that was launched uh, against President Trump right after he took office. And so the fact that that he is now uh, under indictment and under arrest, um, I think, puts puts the whole uh, Steele dossier in, in a new light. And as Jonathan Turley said earlier today, um, this looks like a situation where uh, Danchenko is not the sort of, uh, he's useful in the sense of moving up the chain to go getting someone who's more significant. And so I think, I think we're just starting to see, uh, we will see more from the Durham investigation as this continues. Yeah, it should be interesting to see what happens uh, with that. Going back to the vaccine mandate, Tom, uh, as we heard from Owen, uh, some law enforcement are saying it's really hurting their force. And we've also heard the same from some business owners. How do you think this could impact employers and the country's economic recovery, you know, if people don't follow the mandate? Well, I mean, we've already seen pushback on the mandate, and uh, locally here in my city of Chicago, among the police force, New York, other places, healthcare workers, um, in it's particularly in a situation where we have uh, rising crime rates around the country, 
And so I do think this is going to have a, an economic impact. I mean, I don't think there's any way of getting around the fact, in particular, uh, one of the industries that, that I heard from today was the trucking industry. Any, any uh, trucking company that has more than 100 employees now, uh, they're already facing, these large trucking companies are already facing uh, driver shortfalls around the country, big driver shortfalls. And so if they lose even, even a small percentage of their uh, workforce decides to quit or go find jobs at smaller firms that are under that 100 employee uh, cap, that is only going to exacerbate uh, the supply chain crisis that's already going on in the country. So there's no question that this is going to have ripple effects throughout the economy uh, that's going to that's going to adversely impact uh, growth and, and recovery. Yeah, you mentioned that the supply chain and how it could impact it. Interestingly, uh, the White House Deputy Secretary said today at a briefing this afternoon when asked about it, she said it will not impact the supply chain. I want to get your reaction to that. Well, I just think that's untrue. I just don't think that's that's living in sort of a reality-based world. Um, whenever you have a situation where you're going to have employees that are going to be, whether it's 2% or 5%, uh, whatever, and the administration likes to, they, they are touting all of these examples of where these mandates have been very effective and they've gotten to 99.5% or 99%. Um, there are some estimates that in the trucking industry, for example, that that 25 to 50 percent of truckers are not vaccinated, and they are they are not being allowed uh, to be exempt under the remote workforce rule. At least that's my understanding as of right now. So there's just no question that it's going to affect uh, the supply chain. There's no question also that this is going to be challenged in court uh, from numerous companies and also uh, Republican attorney generals from around the country. Uh, states will challenge this, and, and we'll have to see how that plays out as well. Tom, not a whole lot of time left, probably less than a minute, but uh, I want to switch gears here slightly. I want to talk about uh, election night, a pretty big night for Republicans in Virginia and other states, including in New Jersey, where a truck driver who spent just a little over $150 actually unseated the New Jersey state Senate president. Uh, your thoughts? Well, there's been a lot of focus on, on Virginia and on the education in you, issue in particular in that state. But, you know, I think the, the results are actually worse for Democrats when you look at New Jersey, where there wasn't that education issue roiling the electric there, and they still saw about a 16-point move across that state, away from Democrats, away from President Biden, in just 10 months. If that is, in fact, replicated around the country a year from now, it, it's going to be a disaster for, for Democrats in the House and the Senate. All right, Tom, thank you so much. Always great to get your analysis. Tom Bevin, co-founder and president of Real Clear Politics. Thanks again. Thanks, Tracy. Oh, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says that her caucus has decided it can no longer wait for Senator Joe Manchin to agree with every provision in their multi-trillion dollar Build Back Better bill. So inaction is no longer an option. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has the latest. Sources tell me in a closed door meeting, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi told fellow Democrats that she wants a vote on President Biden's economic agenda bill tonight and then hold a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill Friday morning. We're going to pass both bills, but in order to do so, we have to have votes for both bills, and that's where we are. Negotiations between moderates and progressive Democrats continue. They've added back a paid family leave program to the bill, plus a measure sharply raising the $10,000 cap on state and local tax deductions. But it will face challenges in the Senate. Senator Joe Manchin has objected to include paid family leave. When there's participation between the employer and the employee, from the small uh, small companies, small businesses that I represent all over West Virginia and all over the country. But basically, it should be participation. We can do that in a bipartisan way. Moderates are also publicly worried about immigration-related provisions. Progressive Democrats still want assurances from the Senate that the bill will survive the chamber intact, and those assurances are impossible to give. Republicans continue to tell me the president's agenda is too expensive. A bill that I think is uh, a fraud, that's going to be a uh, pouring gasoline on inflation uh, problems we have in the country. And the reconciliation bill in the House rewards special interest at the expense of the public at large. House Democrats were planning to go on recess next week, but that could be put on hold to get these bills passed. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly.
The House Judiciary Committee heard testimony today from women's reproduction experts. And I never thought that I would hear an OBGYN tell this committee that dismembering a fellow human being is an act of love, an act of freedom. We can and we must do better. The committee held the hearing to better understand the impact of the Texas heartbeat law, which bans abortion once a baby's heartbeat is detected. And joining us now is Christina Bennett, spokesperson for the pro-life organization Live Action. Christina, welcome. So good to be with you today. Uh, first off, let's talk about the Texas heartbeat law and what's happened in the short amount of time that's been in effect. Uh, according to a study from the University of Texas at Austin, abortions dropped by 50 percent in September compared to September of 2020. That's remarkable, Christina. Absolutely. It is amazing. Over 100 unborn lives are saved every day in Texas since the heartbeat bill was enacted. This is really phenomenal legislation. Absolutely. And it seems in Ohio, a bill has been introduced that is very similar to the Texas heartbeat law. Uh, what more can you tell us about that? And how is live action supporting it? The bill that you're referencing is the 2363 bill, and that number represents the number of unborn children that are killed every day in America because of abortion. Jenna Powell and Thomas Hall, and they are the youngest members of the legislature, they have brought forth the 2363 Act. And this is an act that seeks to defend unborn children in the womb, regardless of their gestational age. It is similar to the Texas heartbeat bill, but it doesn't have a particular age. So it defends children from six weeks and even before that. And it's really a revolutionary, forward-thinking piece of pro-life legislation that we're really hoping will pass. And are there any other states enacting similar laws or, or trying to enact a, a similar laws? What do you know? Well, we know that other states are looking at similar laws and they're watching Texas. I know that they're also watching Mississippi and how the Supreme Court will rule. They're also watching Ohio and what they just did. And they are waiting to follow in their footsteps and to defend the unborn in the womb. And Christina, before I let you go, uh, I'm wondering, do you mind, uh, can you tell us about your personal story and how it compelled you to become a, become a pro-life advocate? Absolutely. When I was in college, I discovered that my mom had scheduled to abort me. She had never told me that, and we had never had a conversation about abortion in my household. And I honestly, I'd never heard abortion talked about in church either, so I didn't have a strong understanding of how devastating it truly is. But I discovered that my mother had scheduled to abort me at Mount Sinai Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, and a janitor saved my life. When she was in her hospital robe, when she was minutes away from having the abortion, a janitor saw her, asked her, do you wanna have this baby? My mother said, yes. And she said, God will give you the strength to have your baby. The doctor, the abortionist actually wanted her to stay and when she tried to leave, he ended up yelling at her and say, said, don't leave this room. You've already paid for this. But she ran out and she held it in her heart as a secret. But I discovered it in my 20s and I committed my life to fighting for the ending of abortion and to save unborn lives like we're doing through the 2363 campaign with live action. Oh, Christina, that is incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, You're welcome. What a blessing that janitor was to your mother and to you. And thank you for sharing that and for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Coming up, an important meeting at the Vatican. Hear what was on the agenda for Pope Francis and the Palestinian president. And infamous anniversary. Take a look back at the Iran hostage crisis.
planned peaceful protest in Cuba is setting the stage for new tensions between citizens and the government. A new march is scheduled for November 15th. It is expected to test the regime's tolerance for dissent. There are reports the government is already openly harassing activists. There were widespread protests in Cuba last July. The government arrested hundreds of people, including Catholic clergy, and carried out trials. Well, China is warning families to stock up on food and essentials because of supply chain disruptions. Many headed to supermarkets today. Cooking oil, rice, and vegetables were top items on shopping lists. Unusually heavy rains have added to existing energy shortages and COVID-19 challenges. China's consumers are facing both empty shelves and higher prices. Paul Francis reaffirmed his support for a two-state solution to the situation between Israel and Palestine. <laughs> The Holy Father made the remarks during a meeting with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas at the Vatican. Pope Francis also called for dialogue between the two sides for a, quote, peaceful coexistence. It was the sixth meeting between the Holy Father and the Palestinian president. Joining us now from Rome is Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Andreas, great to see you. Welcome back. Um, so can you tell us why is Mahmoud Abbas in Rome and meeting with the Pope? Good evening, Tracy, and thank you for having me. Mahmoud Abbas is visiting Italy for bilateral negotiations and has made sure also to meet with Pope Francis. We can assume that this meeting is also a matter close to the Pope's heart, as the Vatican signed a treaty in 2015 formally recognizing Palestine as a state despite heavy criticism from Israel. That is also why this visit is delicate. The Holy See seeks to keep a balanced relationship between both Israel and Palestine. Pope Francis has repeatedly expressed his deep concern over growing tensions in the Middle East, especially in Israel. The Holy See is an important platform for negotiations between Israeli and Palestinian leadership as it is perceived as friendly by both sides. And Andreas, do we know exactly what they spoke about? Well, the Holy See press office issued a statement saying that the meeting was cordial. His Holiness reminded others, and I quote, the need to promote human brotherhood and peaceful coexistence among the various faiths. Regarding Israel, the Holy See stressed that it is absolutely necessary to reactivate direct dialogue in order to achieve a two-state solution, and that Jerusalem must be recognized by all as a place of encounter and not of conflict and that its status must preserve its identity and universal value as a holy city for all three Abrahamic religions. In his meetings with Italian representatives, such as the Italian president and prime minister, Abbas reiterated that Palestine was prepared to go to other options and take decisive decisions in the coming weeks if Israel was not willing to accept the two-state solution, thus hinting on using military action. Now, more than ever, it needs strong efforts to bring two, the two parties back together on the negotiating table. Pope Francis seems to be trying just that. And before I let you go, I know this you're someplace a little different than we normally see you. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, Tracy, this is a rather special setting here in the background. I'm in the reception hall of the General Governate of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre. This order supports the church and people living in the Holy Land through charitable works, prayers, and financial support. Now, the Grand Master and the Governor General were so kind to host a new event series of the EWTN Vatican Bureau called Roman Nights. And tonight, we'll have a panel discussion with an ambassador, a businessman, and a professor on the topic of virtue in the workplace. There's a live stream available on our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channels if you're interested. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. We appreciate it. Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Thank you again. Thank you. Up next, the threats facing global security. Our guest helps put it in perspective. And papal prayer intention. The Holy Father shares ways you can lift up others. Iran had a street protest in its capital to mark the anniversary of the U.S. Embassy takeover. Man, man, 
Familiar effigies and chants demonize the U.S., Israel, and the West. Iran Shiite government organized today's commemoration, which was canceled last year due to COVID-19. Tensions between the U.S. and Iran still remain from the 1979 crisis. It took place months after the Islamic Revolution seized power. Followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini breached the U.S. embassy and held 52 hostages for 400 44 days. After months of stalled negotiations, the European Union announced Iran nuclear deal discussions will resume at the end of November. In 2018, President Donald Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal, which was negotiated in part by the Obama administration and reimposed sanctions on Tehran. Now the Biden administration wants the United States to rejoin the agreement as Tehran continues to increase its uranium enrichment. And joining me now to discuss this is Claire Lopez, founder and president of Lopez Liberty LLC. Claire, welcome back. Always great to see you. Uh, at the G20 summit in Rome, world leaders urged Iran to comply with the terms of the 2015 Iran nuclear deal in order to avoid a dangerous escalation. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. And do you think that Iran will actually comply? Uh, the, the last answer first, no, it will not comply. And the problem, of course, now is that the Iranian regime is so far uh, beyond the provisions, in violation of the provisions of the 2015 nuclear deal, the JCPOA, that it's hard to imagine how it could be uh, brought back uh, in terms of amount of uranium enrichment, the level to which they're enriching the uranium above 60% now, uh, the fashioning of uranium metal, which has no civilian purpose, but only a military one to make a bomb, uh, hard to see how they can be brought back uh, to compliance. Yeah, in meantime, uh, according to a recent report, which was in the Times of Israel, a general with the Israeli Defense Forces gave an interview in which he said that Israel would prefer a diplomatic solution to Iran's nuclear ambitions, but is getting ready for other scenarios. Uh, what do you think that signals, Claire, and how concerned should the United States and the international community be? Well, of course, for Israel, uh, this is existential, and they're a lot closer, geographically speaking, to uh, Iran than the United States, and they know that they are uh, the primary target. Uh, every time uh, the, uh, the uh, Iranians are chanting, Mar Bar Israel, death to Israel, um, and Israelis know that that means them, and they mean it, uh, which is why they have to take steps uh, to prepare for their own self-defense, whether or not the United States administration uh, supports them in this at this point or not. Yeah, and Clara, speaking of the United States, you know, how has the administration uh, been in terms of its diplomacy with Iran? What are we seeing? Well, unfortunately, at least from the perspective of the Iranian regime leadership, uh, they see leadership currently now in Washington, D.C., under the Biden administration, uh, as weak. Um, they are taking advantage of that, as I said, with all of those different violations of the 2015 JCPOA. Um, they've taken advantage of that uh, in terms of uh, delaying returning to the nuclear talks, which probably won't uh, amount to anything in any case. They are demanding, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the removal of any and all sanctions ever imposed on the country. Um, but they see weakness in Washington, D.C., and that's very dangerous. They see the Biden administration as more intent uh, on, on a, a achieving a deal, as was the Obama administration before it, and many of the same people are involved now as then. But the regime sees that as, as weakness to be taken advantage of, um, that they talk, perhaps, but continue uh, their, their drive for a deliverable nuclear weapon. Claire, we're running out of time, but I, I really want to talk to you about China. Uh, the Pentagon releasing information recently saying that China is increasing its nuclear arsenal and actually could have up to 1,000 warheads by 2030. What more do you know about that? How concerned should we be? Well, very concerned. And, and the reason is that, once again, as with Iran, uh, the Chinese Communist Party leadership, Xi Jinping and the party, um, sense weakness in Washington, D.C., and they are moving as quickly as possible to take advantage of that. Um, and again, we know 
um, that they are uh, advancing their own, yes, nuclear uh, program, nuclear weapons program. They recently conducted a test of a hypersonic glide vehicle um, that mimicked or, or, or was very similar to uh, the kind of um, missile, hypersonic missile um, uh, threat that we faced from the Soviet Union back some time. Uh, when, uh, unfortunately, the weapons would come at us out of the south, over the South Pole, uh, in what is called a fractional orbital bombardment system, uh, in, in, and aimed upwards from the south. And I don't know if Americans realize this, but the United States has no radar or missile uh, defense uh, uh, systems along our Gulf or Atlantic coasts. Very scary. Thank you so much, Claire, though, for weighing in. We always appreciate your web, your insight. Thank you. Thank you. And finally tonight, Pope Francis releases his prayer intention for the month of November. Terminan por dominar la vida de las personas que se ven desbordado. The Pope's message is dedicated to people who suffer depression and stress. The Holy Father said, let us pray that people who suffer from depression or burnout will find support and a light that opens them up to life. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.